Chairman, and welcome, Mr. Secretary. First, as, um, as a Texan, let me thank you for your sensitivity and your leadership for visiting with the uh, folks at the IRS in Austin, Texas. I have no doubt that Mr. Doggett, I, I believe the facility was in this have more to say, but certainly on behalf of the Texans of this committee, uh, we certainly uh, admire and appreciate what you, you did. Uh, having said that, Mr. Secretary, since you and I are the veterans of many of these hearings, you probably know, don't take it personally, I'm going to be a little less complimentary of your leadership on the economy. It was a year ago that the stimulus bill was signed into law by the President. We were told that unemployment would not exceed 8 percent. We were told that the legislation would create or save three and a half million jobs. A year later, we know that has not proven to be true. A recent quote from the Associated Press, quote, 10 months into President Barack Obama's first economic stimulus plan, a surge in spending on roads and bridges has had no effect on local unemployment and only barely helped the beleaguered construction industry. We know that money has gone into projects like $49,000 of taxpayer money for rubber tennis courts in Bozeman, Montana, uh, roughly a half a million dollars for a skateboard park in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and the list goes on. Unfortunately, as we all know, unemployment continues to hover around 10 percent, a generational high. We know that since the bill has been passed that jobs have been lost every single month with the exception of one. We know that since the President was sworn in that four million of our fellow countrymen now find themselves out of work, and human suffering continues from coast to coast. And last but not least, if you add on the interest, we know that the American people are now $1.2 trillion deeper in debt, roughly $10,000 per household. And now we understand that the President and Congress are talking about yet another stimulus program. I understand that the vocabulary has changed. I'm not sure the policies have. My guess is the American people believe enough is enough. When they hear more stimulus, they think more debt. And certainly, all we can see is debt in the budget that the President has presented us. Already, on top of signing into law an increase of 84 percent in non-defense discretionary spending, we are now presented with the largest budget in our nation's history, the largest budget deficit in our nation's history, $1.6 trillion. Over 10 percent of our economy, the largest is a percentage of our economy since World War II, the largest debt in our nation's history, $9.3 trillion, weighing in at roughly 63 percent of our economy, once again the largest as a percentage of the economy since World War II. Under the President's budget, interest on the debt alone will quadruple by 2020, reaching $840 billion, roughly six to $7,000 per household, just to pay the interest cost on the debt under the President's submitted budget. It was a couple of weeks ago that O&B Director Dr. Orzag was before us, and he admitted that deficits above 3 percent of GDP are unsustainable Yet, as I look at the President's budget each and every year, we have a budget deficit exceeding 3 percent, which, according to the administration, is unsustainable. Uh, this nation was already on a precarious fiscal road uh, prior to this administration. Uh, today, it is unequivocal that the nation is on the road uh, to bankruptcy if we do not change our ways. Uh, it, this budget has us on the road from taking government to costing 20 percent of our economy, its average post-war era uh, average, to 40 percent uh, when children who are born today <coughs> enter the workforce. At that point, millions will never have their opportunity to own their own home. Millions will never have an opportunity to go to college. Millions will never have an opportunity to start a new business. Surely, surely we can do better. I spent a lot of the break in February, particularly since we were snowed in, speaking to small businessmen in my district, those who are a landscaper, a building materials small businessmen. 
I talk to community bankers. I talk to Fortune 500 CEOs. I talk to investment managers who manage billions of dollars, and I, all, I heard a similar message from each and every one of them. Great fear and uncertainty on how this nation is going to deal with this level of debt and deficit. A fear to start or expand a new business not knowing the outcome. <coughs> fear of a potential multi-trillion dollar takeover of the national health care system and what that could potentially do to labor cost. The threat of a potential $800 billion energy tax on our economy. Continued bailouts, as we heard on Christmas Eve, that all of a sudden we now have unlimited taxpayer exposure to the bailout of <coughs> Fannie and Freddie. A bailout nation where the big get bigger, the small get smaller, and the taxpayer gets poorer. Uh, the new bank tax, I'm not sure, even though it may feel good to be punitive, I'm not sure any American believes that somehow, somehow their interest rate is going to go down or a line of credit is going to be opened up if their banker gets a new tax. Now, I have no doubt eventually this economy will rebound. Uh, by any historic standard, we already ought to be out of this recession. Uh, but when I talk to those who create jobs and invest in jobs, growth, and opportunity, uh, in my section of Texas, uh, the policies of this administration are hampering job growth, uh, and they must change. And I hope uh, in the future that the administration will look upon jobs as job number one and put forth a plan to deal with the debt and deficit that ultimately will bankrupt our country. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Now let me attend to one housekeeping detail. I ask unanimous consent that any member who wishes to submit an opening statement may do so at this point in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Secretary, the floor is yours. You can summarize your statement as you see fit. Uh, I think you know that we have some absences today because we're in competition with three or four other committees, but uh, we regard your testimony as extremely important to us, and you can take your time and proceed as you, <coughs> as you desire. Thank you again for coming here today. We look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Henserling, members of the Budget Committee. It's a pleasure to be here today and to talk to you about some of the major challenges we face as a country and the, and the challenges we have to face together. I want to thank Congressman Henserling for, the, for beginning where he began by uh, reminding us of the tragic attack that we saw in Austin, Texas last week. I was there with Commissioner Shulman on uh, Monday. and. It was just extraordinary to look in the eyes of those people and hear them tell the story of what they did working together to get out of that building as quickly as possible. They saved many, many lives. And it was extraordinary to listen to them talk about the pride they have in serving their country as public servants um, at a time when uh, we're all facing together uh, a really difficult uh, set of challenges. But thank you for what you said. I, I very much appreciate it. And I have uh, tremendous pride and respect for the men and women of the IRS who are working hard every day to try to make sure that the can do what it needs to do to protect our national security, to make sure that we're providing uh, health care, basic, basic services to millions of Americans. They do a necessary, important thing, and we all owe them our honor and our respect. A year ago, when the President took office, the essential, urgent task facing the country was to act forcefully to prevent a second Great Depression. And a year later, in large part to the actions uh, we took under the Recovery Act and to steps we took to put out the financial fire, our economy is now growing again. The economy is now healing. This process is going to take time, but it's important to not acknowledge the progress we have seen to date in starting uh, this process of healing and repair. This is progress, but it's not enough, and we need to do everything possible to reinforce strong economic growth led by the private sector that extends to communities across the country. And we need to make sure also that Americans and investors around the world have confidence that once we have sustained growth in place, that we're going to bring down these unsustainable deficits. Now, these are complementary. They are not competing objectives. If you care about future deficits, and you have to care about these future deficits, you need to care about economic growth today. Because if not, if we don't have growth, our future deficits will be higher. And if you care about economic growth, you have to care about these deficits, because without confidence that over time we're going to be able to work together to bring these deficits down, then future growth will be weaker. Right now, Mr. Chairman, our top priority has to be to spur job creation and private investment. 
Last week I was in North Carolina and I met with business owners in Durham and I heard how because of a very careful, smart program to provide tax incentives that incent private investment, we saw people take a warehouse that had been vacant for a decade in an area that had unemployment three times the national average, renovated, turned into a business center that now employs uh, hundreds of people in a range of different businesses. That's a good example of smart policy uh, that has a good bang for the buck, but we need to do a lot more. And that's why we proposed a series of measures to provide support to small businesses, to invest in infrastructure and clean energy, to assist state and local governments so they can prevent future layoffs. These are immediate, important steps we can take together. But in order to lay the foundation for longer-term growth in the future, we have to invest in innovation and reform. We need financial reform because families and businesses deserve a financial system that supports investment in future innovations, not just future real estate booms. We need to support innovation with incentives that encourage investment in research and development. We need to increase exports so that because the more products our businesses make and sell to other countries, the more jobs we're going to see in the United States. We need to invest in education because businesses need an education system that does a better job today of creating the workforce of tomorrow. And of course, we need health care reform so that we can help provide greater economic security for middle class families and help businesses reduce future growth and health care costs. Now, these are built on the basic, simple idea that the role of government is to create conditions for private sector businesses, large and small, to grow and expand. And the President outlined today, before the Business Roundtable, a series of reform proposals to support that objective. And I think these are proposals.